So welcome back. We are looking at this very exciting idea that theorem proving in logic can be used to do arithmetic. And of course, this idea that Kowalski put forward was more general than that. He said that theorem proving can do computation that any computation that you are interested in doing. Arithmetic is just one kind of computation that you want to do. So, we saw in this last video how this is a proof of the fact that 2 plus 5 is equal to 7. So, we gave 2 plus 5 is equal to 7 or plus 2, 5, 7 as a goal, converted it into its, uh, uh, con uh, negated it, added it to the set of clauses and eventually derived the null clause. That is how the resolution repetition works essentially. Now, let us answer the query. Is there an x such that 2 plus 5 is equal to x? Okay. So, the same thing that the program is still the same and the only difference is the query has a variable and remember that variables in queries are existentially quantified essentially. The resolution happens in the same fashion. We start with that query which says that uh, is 2 plus 5 equal to some u and we reduce it to a query which says is 1 plus 5 equal to some v essentially. And what is this v? This v is such that u is a successor of v essentially. So, whatever v is you will be you will have to add 1 to that because u is the successor of v essentially. And you should look at the unification algorithm and see that you can indeed get this uh, substitution. Then we reduce it to another goal, another sub goal and this goal says that show us that 0 plus 5 equal to w. Again what is this w? This w is such that v is the successor of this thing. So, you can see that if you can get the value of w, then if you add 1 to it, you will get the value of v and if you add 1 to this, you will get a value of u essentially. That query succeeds. It succeeds with the fact that both x and w now they unify with this number which is 5 essentially. So, w we get the value of w is equal to 5 and as a consequence we get a value that u is equal to 5 plus 1 plus 1 as we said here if you are going to add 1 and 1 then you will get the answer. So, it can answer existential queries essentially. Right? You can instead of using some other code to add to numbers, you can jolly well prove, you can jolly well do addition using theorem proving, but it is obviously not advisable essentially. Just imagine that if you wanted to add let us say 20,000 with 11,500, then since you are recursing on the left hand side from 20,000, you will you know have 20,000 steps of derivation just to find out the two numbers are there. So, clearly we do not use logic programming for things like addition, but we show that the, it is based on the foundations of mathematics essentially. And one of the one of the selling points of logic programming is that program correctness is something that we can do much more easily in logic programs than in imperative programs essentially. And program correctness is a big, big thing because you know if you are writing programs which are doing very important stuff, then you have, it is very difficult to show that they are correct. And uh, instead of showing that they are correct, most peop, most uh, software companies, they would rely on testing. So, they would test it in all kinds of input and then say that, okay, it has not failed any test. So, it must be correct. So, there is a leap of faith there. Whereas, the selling point for logic programming is that you can show that it is correct, 
but obviously you will not do things like addition and multiplication by two names. So, just think of multiplication logically speaking multiplication would be repeated addition essentially. So, if you want to multiply 3 by 5 uh, then you multiply 5 times you multiply with 3 essentially. 5 times you add 3, 3 to itself. Here is where the answer predicate that we had talked about comes in handy. So, here we start off by saying that tell us what is the sum of 2 and 5 and store that in this answer predicate essentially. So, after the first resolution step we already know that it is a successor of V, then we already know that it is a successor of successor of W and by the time we come we terminate the program we have the answer readily available in our answer predicate. So, you can see that this answer predicate can be a good mechanism for extracting the answer essentially because it is a it will be available in that directly. I am jumping into this lecture a little bit. I was in a lecture which is in the future and I suddenly remembered that there was something I had forgotten to say uh, and I had to do a bit of time travel to come back to this lecture. So, I will quickly say that and then go back to my um, other lecture essentially. So, there is a point that we had mentioned sometime that first order logic is semi decidable. I thought I will come and give an example about that and it should help clarify things. So, Robinson had said that the resolution method is refutation complete. So, first order logic is complete, it is both sound and complete. This means that if the knowledge base entails a sentence alpha, then if you add negation of alpha to the knowledge base, then it will lead to a contradiction, which in terms of the resolution refutation method, we said that it would derive the null clause, which we also de depicted using a square essentially. So, it is complete, which means that whenever there is a, whenever a sentence is entailed, we will be able to find a proof for that. And what Robinson showed was that there is this new rule of inference called the resolution rule. And if you use that in the proof by contradiction mode, which means you add the negation of the goal as we have done here uh, to to the knowledge base, then it will there will always be a proof which will end in the empty clause. The question we want to address is about termination. So, desirability is to do with termination that given any problem will your program terminate or not. Now, it has been shown that first order logic is semi decidable. The question is whether a theorem proving algorithm will terminate or not terminate essentially. So, it turns out that the situation is as follows that if the conclusion is entailed and the logic is a complete logic for example, the resolution reputation method, then a proof exists. And once that happens, a search strategy can always be devised to which will find the proof. So, you can imagine that in a resolution reputation method also, if you just go down one path like we do in backward chaining, uh, you might end up into some infinite loop essentially. But you can always on the other hand think of strategies which are closer to what we known as breadth first search strategies which are guaranteed to find solutions when which exist one. Uh, we can always devise such a proof strategy which will find the proof. So, if a proof exists the algorithm we can devise algorithms that will find the proof hmm. and more if you want to look at more on search you should look at my course called AI search methods in problem solving which is offered in the alternate uh, semesters in NPTEL. So, if a proof exists, we can devise algorithms which will find the proof 
and terminate. But if the goal is not entailed by the knowledge base, which means that there is no way of showing that it is true, there is no way of proving that it is true, then the theorem prover can go into an infinite loop essentially. And this is special to the first order logic case. In proportional logic, because there is only a finite number of symbols that you are working with, at some point you can say you have exhausted all possibilities and you can terminate by saying that no, I cannot find a proof. That is not the case in first order logic, is that the algorithm will keep searching essentially. So, I will give you an example of that and hopefully that will help make it clear. So, look at this very small knowledge base, it has only one sentence. It says that if the successor of x is less than y, then x must be less than y. Basically. So, which I hope you will accept. It says for example, if the successor of 3 which is 4, it is less than y, let us say y is 10. If 4 is less than 10, then 3 is less than 10. That we are willing to accept as a true statement. But which of course, in clause form we will represent it like this uh, and by now I hope you are familiar with the clause form representation. Let us say we have a query which says is 0 less than 0, can you show that 0 is less than 0. Then in the resolution refutation method we will take the negation of this query and add it to the knowledge base which is shown here, not less than 0, 0. Now, this is a negative uh, literal, it is a negative clause and it will match this positive clause on the in the knowledge base or positive literal in the knowledge base in that uh, clause which is also a, a positive clause or positive definite clause. Uh, and we will derive a sub goal which says that 1 which is the successor of 0, this is saying it is 1 is now less than 0. This one is saying 0 less than 0, but not because we have negated it essentially. So, what this inference step is saying is that 0 is not less than 0 if 1 is not less than 0. This process will continue, we will always keep matching this positive literal in that in the in that clause in the knowledge base. And so we started by saying that 0 is not less than 0, then we are saying 1 is not less than 0, then we are saying 2 is uh, not less than 0, then we are saying 3 is not less than 0. So, if you look at this carefully, you can see that this will be a never ending process and uh, we will never be able to say, say that 0 is less than 0. So, if you look at it from the logic perspective, what is this proof saying? It is saying that 0 is less than 0 if 1 is less than 0 and 1 is less than 0 if 2 is less than 0 and 2 is less than 0 if 3 is less than 0. Remember that we are moving in the backward direction. We are moving from the goal to the antecedent essentially. So, if we have 0 here, then we will have 1 here. If we have 1 here, we will have 2 here and so on. So, that is how it will keep backward chaining and it will never stop obviously. So, that is what I wanted to say and uh, uh, you can continue with your logic programming and horn clauses. I will go back to my lecture in the future. So, let us now focus on the fact that we are doing resolution and we want to look at a subset of first order logic which is called Horn clause logic and the name is due to Alfred Horn who invented it essentially. So, what is Horn clause logic? A Horn clause is a clause with at most one positive literal at most one positive literal, it can have 0 literals or it can have one positive literal, not more than one. What does that mean? 
it means you cannot make statements like s or v that's not a horn clause because it has got two positive literals so horn clauses we are going to focus on is a subset of what you can express in first order logic only a subset can be expressed in horn clause logic but the nice thing about horn clause logic is that it's going to be very efficient essentially we had said in passing that it has been shown that resolution proofs can be exponentially long which means the exponent proof finding process can now be even more exponential whereas horn clause logic makes things very efficient but the price you pay is that you cannot express disjunction of this kind s u v s or v or something and disjunction is something which computer science has always grappled with essentially it's not very easy to find uh, to, to, to tackle disjunction so these are the clauses so as you can see in this there is only one uh, positive literal and if you work with the first order case we can add some arguments it can have more than one arguments it doesn't matter i have just used x here uh, which uh, in clause form is written like what we have shown above but uh, in uh, in in good old first order logic format we can write it as an implication where p and q and r and s Im implies t and that is the form that Prolog also uses essentially the same thing is there for first order logic. Something implies something. So a set of antecedents and one consequent. Only one consequent is allowed because we said there is only one positive literal allowed essentially. So such clauses are called positive definite horn clauses. A pro prologue program is essentially a collection of positive definite horn clauses. It has, as we said, exactly one positive literal. Uh, facts have no negative literals, they have only the positive literal. And uh, so facts are like this T of A or something like that, or T of X. T of X can be a fact. All we are saying is that for all X, TX is true, whatever the T predicate is. Rules have some number of negative literals, as we saw, which can be either written in clause form like this or as an implication like this. And as I said, prologue chooses the implication form. So, a prologue pro program is a collection of positive definite clauses. There must be at least one positive clause in every statement of the prolog program. So, it is a set of positive definite horn clauses. Uh, as we said, uh, uh, it uses those these things. The syntax of prolog is different. I have mentioned this earlier also. Is that uh, uh, capitalized arguments are variables. Arguments that begin with capital letters are variables. And and arguments which are on only in lowercase are con constants essentially. So, prologue distinguishes between variables and constants using capitals versus not capitals. We used to say that uh, anything with a question mark is a variable and anything without a question mark is a constant. So, this is prologue's uh, style of doing things. The other thing that prologue does is it reverses the implication sign. So, instead of writing that that something p and q and r and s implies t, it writes this as t if p and q and r and s. So, you can see it uses this symbol and you can read this symbol as if t x is true if all these are true and you can read this symbol as and. So, if you want to now read this in first order terms you are saying for all x t x is true if p x is true and q x is true and r x is true and s x is true essentially. The consequent is written on the left hand side. A fact so in prologue we often distinguish between facts and rules. Uh, rules are the ones which have implication signs facts do not have any implication this thing. 
a fact is a consequent without any antecedent essentially. So, this T of A it does not have any any antecedents. So, it just stands by itself. So, it is true. It is not conditionally true. When we write a rule like this one, we are saying T x is conditionally true provided P x is true, Q x is true, R x is true and S is x s is true. Hmm. So, that is how we like write in prolog. Notice that we use a full stop. This is part of the syntax of prolog, but we will be covering prolog a little bit more and hopefully you will get an idea of that essentially. I have already presented this earlier when we were talking about backward chaining and goal trees and we constructed a goal tree for this which I will not do again, but this is just to remind you that when we were looking at goal trees and backward chaining this is one of the knowledge bases that we had seen and I had even then said that this is how it would be represented in prolog. So, now the thing is clear I hope that uh, this statement that we have that the dinner plan is true if you have a restaurant x and your friend likes x. And in logic uh, we wrote that if it is true that x is a restaurant and your friend likes x, then you have a dinner plan. So, in prologue you, you write the antecedent on the right and the consequent on the left and you can see that that simplifies writing processors for processing prolog because you just have to keep scanning the, the knowledge base from top to down and you have to keep matching. Remember we want to use unification. We keep matching with the left hand the first, our first term that we see or the first atomic formula that we see there. Uh, we keep matching with that. If it matches we move to the right hand side. If it does not match then we just try the next thing to match essentially. So, as we will see uh, prologue essentially does depth first search on the goal tree that we had constructed which translates that if you have a text file is that it if you have something to match. So, supposing you, you want to show that there is a dinner plan essentially right. So, you will start with the top till you find this dinner plan. So, when you find this dinner plan, then you will move to the right hand side. Then you want to show that there is a restaurant. Then again it will start searching from the top and keep coming down till it comes to a restaurant. So, it first looks at a restaurant and accepts that essentially. Then it moves forward to go and check whether your friend likes that restaurant. So, again it would go down in this knowledge base from top to down till it reaches that like statements. So, you have this uh, like statement. By the, by the time you have come here, you have, you have said that the restaurant is the pizza hut. So, you are looking for a statement which says that uh, um, your friend likes pizza hut. So, your friend likes beach, uh, your friend likes the matrix, your friend likes Bhuvan Shom, your friend like, likes Saravana Bhuvan but he does not like Pizza Hut. So, it backtracks and tries the next rest restaurant which is Rana Bhavan and then it can succeed essentially. So, Prolog does depth first search on the goal tree which I have not drawn here, but you should go back and look at the goal tree. It does depth first search on that and that depth first search translates to top to bottom in the text file or in the lexical order as you might say and within that from left to right. So, when you have to show the dinner plan, you first show that it x is a restaurant, then you show that your friends likes x. Now, logically speaking it does not matter whether you want to show restaurant first or whether you want to show friend likes x, you could search in some arbitrary fashion, but prolog does not do this arbitrary search. In prolog the user defines the order in which you will search. So, in that sense the user has more control and therefore, the prolog search space does not grow exponentially essentially. So, the user has a greater say in this matter. This So, in pure prolog all this would not be specified. In pure prolog you would do things in some order, but in prologs that we implement this order is implicit 
and therefore the user has to be careful in writing programs in a uh, certain order. As we will see, uh, you would always be advised to write base clauses first and then recursive clauses after that because when you hit the base clause, you do not want to get caught in the recursive clause before that exactly. So, you must first see if the base clause is true, then you must go and check for the reserve. So, these are in some sense, there is some amount of procedural control built into that. In pure logic programming, which where this such a problem would not be there, we would just leave it totally to the machine. But we do not do that in practice because that would be too expensive. Okay, so, we will take another break and uh, we will come back and uh, look at horn clauses. So, remember that horn clauses are clauses of this kind that you are seeing on this slide. Uh, they are implication statements of the kind P and Q and R implies T. There can be only one consequent, any number of and ended uh, atomic formulas. There is no negation in prologue and that also we will see here. So, you cannot write not P and Q implies T because if you unravel this, you will see that it is not really always a horn clause essentially. So, these kind of statements and other kind of statements are facts where you say P full stop. For example, here movie matrix full stop and that is a fact essentially. So, horn clauses are clauses of this kind. Uh, we will go back to our uh, clause form representation and see what is really happening inside prologue as seen from the perspective of resolution method essentially. So, we will do that in the next session. Okay.